Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. Side event of ICLE together with the um, Committee of the Regions. My name is Gino van Begin. I'm the uh, Secretary General of ICLE. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Um, for us, um, the first event, um, side event that we do every year at each of the Bond Talks and COPs, obviously um, events like these. Um, but this is the first time after the adoption of the uh, Paris package and 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 including the agreements and the COP decision. So it is it is great to um, be here together with you and um, to um, have a, a round of discussions and interactions on how we also from local governments we feel how to bring the implementation of the Paris packages yeah. further. Um, let me just start by by saying that from an ICLE perspective we have or we, we host the role of the local governments and municipal authorities focal point to the UNFCC. So we have been following this process since um, actually since um, the Bali um, uh, COP and where, where nations um, launched their climate roadmap and then over Copenhagen and then of course over the various COPs leading to, to Paris. And it is, it is a, a great pleasure to see not only that nations have taken bold and ambitious um, action and commitments under the Paris Agreement, but more importantly, from our perspective, have reached out towards other stakeholders, in our case, local governments, regional governments, to bring um, those other levels of government on board in the implementation. And so we have been seeking over the um, last uh, maybe seven, eight years, not only a recognition of the role and the potential of um, local and regional governments um, to support uh, national actions, and in this case now national contributions for mitigating and adapting to climate change, but also uh, to see local governments, regional governments as spheres of government that can be supportive to um, those um, NDCs now. And so we are moving from our perspective into a new era in the sense that our um, partnership, our advocacy, our lobbying towards nations here in Bonn or at other places where COPs come together have moved from that first demand we had, please recognize and empower um, um, other levels of your governments within your countries to now how can we take benefit of that empowerment of that recognition and how can we work with each other in order to um, to um, um, implement the uh, the agreements and I can only say that from the um, experiences also in Paris where we had set up a pavilion of cities and regions during the two weeks uh, but also have have pushed already um, uh, cities and regions around the world to come up with with ideas, with concepts, with with projects of how they can help to um, achieve within within their countries um, NDCs and 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 all in all in that sense a transformative um, um, action, a transformative approach towards towards change um, within the climate, but also overall sustainability agenda and we have seen enormous activity and a very good spirit at both sides and i think we we are now coming here in bonn um to 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 elaborate further and to build upon that good spirit of paris and now to seek um with with nations um how we can best um um move on further and and of course our our next rendezvous will be in marrakesh where um, um, also from our perspective from ICLE, we are, we are now already trying to set up together with other partners um, a, a sort of conference where we will look into the implementation manners and, 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 and pathways for um, um, other levels of government than the parties to um, support the entire implementation of the Paris Agreement. So we will have a discussion here um, around um, those, that, that, that topic and around those issues and I'm 
very, very pleased to have here with us a very competent um, and, and, and very friendly um, panel um, that we could um, bring together here in Bonn. And, and first of all, I would like to, um, to welcome Mr. Karl-Heinz Lambertz, who is the first vice president of the Committee of the Regions and the president of the parliament of the German speaking community in Belgium. Um, and, uh, but, but Mr. Lambert is here in particular to um, represent the Committee of the Regions. And for those who um, may not be familiar with the Committee of the Regions, it is one of the institutions of the European Union that has a mandatory consultation uh, competence on various issues that are relevant to um, urban or regional areas and um, in that sense we have collaborated um, with the committee of the regions in various um, at various stages and phases um, uh, towards the um, uh, paris uh, agreements and also in paris so mr lambert welcome um, and, and we are very pleased that you accepted our invitation to be here. Um, then we have um, next to me Mr. Michel Rentenaar, who is the uh, special envoy of the Netherlands and, of course, who hosts now or holds now the EU presidency um, on behalf of the Netherlands, um, also in these uh, discussions here. So, Welcome, Michel. We have uh, been working with Michel um, and the government of the Netherlands over many years now, and, 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 and Michel himself personally has been a very strong advocate for, for, for finding good mechanisms between nations and other spheres of government um, within those nations to move on uh, towards, towards and after Paris. Um, my colleague, Marijke van Staden, who is uh, the manager of, of ICLEI's Low Carbon um, Cities Agenda, and um, Marijke also is the director of our Bond Center for Local Climate Action, and, and she deals with everything that has to do with the um, uh, climate agenda within ICLEI and, and, and our 1,500 cities with whom we are engaged with. So, Welcome, Marek, and you will take um, the floor later on as well. And then we have a number of discussants here with us, and um, welcome, first of all, to Dadashi Matsumoto, who is um, a senior officer of the um, within the Regional Development Policy um, Unit in of the OECD. And um, we have, um, over the last two, three years, have been intensively worked together as well on issues of governance um, on issues of climate um, um, uh, policy making within um, uh, with, with, within the OECD and with ICLEI. Um, Brendan Guy, who is the manager for um, uh, international policy of the uh, National Resource Defense Council in the United States and a steering committee member of galvanizing the groundswell of climate actions, and Brendan will give his views further um, on on the um, aspects of um, of the climate regime or the new climate regime and how how to to move us further there and then um jan francois who is the uh, representative of um of the city of paris and he uh, leads the climate and energy strategies uh, within paris and obviously um not only because of the cop took place in paris but in particularly because paris has taken very bold actions um, under his leadership in the field of climate mitigation and further adaptation so uh, Jan, it is a pleasure to have you with us here as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, then finally introduce my colleague and the friend uh, Susanna Nolden, who um, is the um, um, officer here of the International Affairs Department of the City of Bonn. Um, ICLEI's, um its headquarters is hosted uh, by Bonn here in Bonn. And so it is a pleasure to have uh, Suzanne with us, who will take over from now and um, guide us in a timely perspective uh, through the, um, through the um, agenda um, and, and, and have an a animated discussion. Uh, so Suzanne, please take, take my seat here and I will go to your seat over there. And I'll take my card as well. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you, Gino, for having done most of my work already. <laughs> that was amazing. Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for a bit of housekeeping. This session is scheduled until a quarter to us, a quarter past six, so 75 minutes to go. Interesting inputs to come. 
And before uh, we waste time, I just have two housekeeping infos. The first of it is the normal one. Please switch your mobile phones off or put them on vibration at least. The second one is uh, we are webcasted today. Uh, we have an audio webcast as a pilot project. And there is also the opportunity to uh, Twitter questions in here. So on the YouTube channel, uh, you will find uh, this webcast. So without wasting more time, I would like to um, ask, uh, Karl, ask Mareike van Staden to take over. Mareike is the officer for Low Carbon Cities Agenda and the director of the Bonn Center for Local Climate Action and Reporting, the Carbon Center. And Marika will bring us a bit into the details of what happens after Paris and what is the roadmap uh, local governments have pursued and will pursue. Marika, will you take over? Thank you very much, Susanna. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, we are going to talk about ambition and action. I like those two words already. Um, most of you who are in the room have received the very brief Paris Climate Package, and for those online, this will also be available for download on the ICLA website. And we'll quickly run through that. It's an easy guide to understand uh, where did we come from and where are we going to in this space of climate action. I'm specifically going to talk about the COP21 outcomes and the way forward for local and subnational governments in raising ambition and accelerating action. So in a nutshell, behind us, you see the nutshell, um, the road towards COP, where did, where did all of this originate um, and how did we come to the point we are now? What happened at the COP21 in Paris? The key outcomes of the Paris Climate Package as well as accompanying the implementation of the Paris Climate Package through integrated local transformation. So the road towards COP21 was uh, paved, started with good intentions and I think was paved also with good intentions and amazing collaboration between city representatives as well as city networks um, through the local government climate roadmap. This was launched at the COP13 in Bali and started a whole process of consultation of mobilizing cities and towns and regions around the world to engage in this climate dialogue. Um, the highlights of the roadmap <clears throat> were featured in every single COP, starting uh, in particular with Copenhagen, where we had high hopes of reaching a climate deal, where we had also one of the biggest delegations of, of local and subnational leaders coming together, speaking with their national governments within the, in the COP framework. Um, and that continued uh, through Mexico City, Durban, activities in Nantes, not a COP, but also a key activity um, in terms of conferencing. At Warsaw, we had also city minister uh, dialogues, mayor minister dialogues. In Lima, the preparation very much set for, for the Paris COP. And then finally, at the Paris COP, um, success achieved in terms of what we wanted and were asking for from the parties. Now, the process also was linked to uh, the ADP process. So we use all these abbreviations. ADP stands for Ad Hoc Working Group on the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action, ADP for short. This was very important, uh, having that dialogue within the UNFCCC framework um, within the negotiations. Specifically, um, the technical examination process was very important, where we had the opportunity to get city speakers, regional speakers, involved in, in uh, presenting what they're actually doing, good practice cases, that were discussed also with the national governments. And this was excellent and that process will also continue um, and certainly even strengthen on many additional topics. But we had um, 10 processes on renewable energy, on energy efficiency in the urban environment. And all of these were incredibly valuable to get a better understanding amongst the parties on what is possible at the local and subnational level. We also had systems and procedures that were not within the framework of the UNFCCC, such as the 2014 UN Climate Summit. But these helped to shape and bring together initiatives such as the Compact of Mayors and the, uh, the Compact of States and Regions to really mobilize um, additional efforts to bring together partnerships. And these partnerships are now part of the process, as I will briefly show you. Pictures like these, the photograph of the, the mayors at the Paris summit, amazing experiences, mobilizing and also encouraging each other because this is very much part of what has to happen at the local and subnational level. 
there's a support network in place. Your neighboring communities are also active in, in the climate work. This is something that we wish to also scale up globally and get many more mayors. Hopefully the next picture will be twice the size or three times the size. Looking at the Paris Agreement and the COP21 decision. So the Paris Agreement is an annex to the COP21 decision. I'm not going to run through every single word in this slide because it's text heavy, but this essentially captures the legal framework within which we work now at this stage. So the Paris Agreement um, very strongly um, in its preamble recognizes the importance um, of engagement of all levels of government. Again, this is, it sounds simple, but it was a huge effort also to make sure that that recognition is actually part of the process. And this will also enable future steps um, where ideally all levels of national governments in a country work together and explore approaches together. Um, when you look at the COP21 decision, which was actually, um, that came into immediate effect in Paris already, uh, several uh, references were made to local and subnational governments. Excuse my voice and getting a bit rusty. Uh, too much talking this week. Skipping to the next slide, we had through the local government climate roadmap three views, three aims, recognizing the importance of local and subnational governments in the space of climate action mitigation as well as adaptation and resilience, engaging with your local and subnational governments, and empowering. Um, these these governments. The interesting part, the word empowerment we know was, was a difficult word, but we also kept it in because that's exactly what we wish to see. Local action is where action is needed on both um, the front mitigation happens in a geographical space. Thank you very much. Um, adaptation and resilience happens in a geographical space. Your cities, your local governments, urban spaces is the logical place where this uh, action needs to happen. But you also need to engage your subnational level, your provinces, your states, your regions, um, all working together. I want to zoom in on the engage part because that's also where we wish to accelerate and act, um, and that continues as well. Um, a few highlights. Again, this is a very dense text, but that mayor ministerial dialogue was quite key. We need to get much more of that in country, ideally. It doesn't have to happen in a UNFCCC space, it can happen in every single country, and it should because that's also where you need to understand uh, or reach a common understanding of the approaches that could be taken. Um, certainly, we do not also necessarily support only a top-down approach. There needs to be dialogue and discussion um, and a clear understanding who does what, which level of government has which mandate. Um, some of the um, activities I mentioned already, Compact of Mayors, Covenant of Mayors, incredibly important initiatives to mobilize more and more local governments to engage, to commit to something specific and to track their activities and their impacts. One particular highlight was the Lima Paris Action Agenda. Um, the French presidency has released a document, a very short summary of what, what this covers. It will now become the Global Action Agenda um, and it really captures a number of key initiatives that we welcome any single local and subnational government to connect to. Uh, it does, it's not exhaustive. There are obviously many initiatives not part of this agenda, but still, it's a good starting point, and we hope that this will grow and be an inclusive approach as well. The Friends of Cities is a particularly interesting element, and I hope also Michelle will maybe reference to that. This is an initiative um, created within the framework of the UNFCCC for parties to engage if they wish to support their cities and subnationals. Um, clearly, this is also part of a closed dialogue group where more discussion can be happen, can occur, and also learning from countries where there is already excellent vertical integration in terms of collaboration between different levels of government. So, raising the ambition and accelerating action, zooming in on these two points. We now have the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, which is a wonderful starting point. What we need now to do is strengthen these NDCs. How are local and subnational targets, commitments and efforts embedded in the NDCs? Are they embedded? How are they embedded? What structures, what processes would help support that connection between the levels of government? Key questions which we need to answer and also which we, which we promote in this UNFCCC processes at the moment to help start and stimulate these discussions. Accelerating action, that happens at the local and subnational level. 
the transformative actions is what we wish to see moving forward strongly on systems that also connect to sustainable development. This cannot be disconnected from the SDGs and making sure that there's global exchange and knowledge exchange um, and knowledge development. There's a lot happening. We need to capture that properly and make sure that the peer-to-peer -peer exchange can take place and we can move forward. Some brief contact information for Ikle uh, and myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mareike. And what kind of question would you like to bring up for the panel for the later discussion? Mm, I have many, many questions. It's difficult to pinpoint it down to one. But in fact, maybe to the whole panel, um, how can we actually better collaborate together to also make sure we can raise the level of ambition and move forward and accelerate? I think the partnership angle is for me quite key to um, making sure we can accelerate. Thank you. So without delay, we go over to our co-organizers, the Committee of the Regions, the voice of the cities and regions in the European Union. And I would like to welcome Karl-Heinz Lamberts on the panel uh, and ask him, what is the benefit for the European Union of working together with non-party stakeholders and explicitly with cities and regions? What is the potential of the multi-level governance in the EU? Mr. Lamberts. Thank you very much. I will try to give an answer uh, and in each case I will uh, give an answer to the questions I ask to myself. It's typical for politicians, uh, politicians and uh, and I'm really not a specialist in climate questions. Uh, perhaps I am a super specialist because uh, I don't know if you know what is a super specialist. A specialist knows very much things about a small area of knowledge, and a super specialist knows all things about nothing. <laughs> now, <laughs> finish with the jokes. Uh, first, I I would like to to thank. Uh, Ikle, uh, for this good and great cooperation we had uh, since a certain moment. And you did uh, a very uh, tremendous job in bringing the added value of local and regional authorities in climate action to the attention of the parties. Gaining recognition of the local and regional role uh, in an intergovernmental arena like the UNFCCC uh, certainly was a, a very, very important first uh, step. And that is not always evident. But we must also see uh, the difficult part starts now. And the questions are clear. How can we work together effectively? Uh, you asked the question. I will ask the question also. Perhaps someone give us the, us the answer, answer. And how we can coordinate, uh, because uh, it is not um, only important to do something, but it must be done on a real coordinated way if we want to have success uh, in the next years and uh, in, in the next century, because I'm sure that we are very uh, confronted uh, with something that will be very, very, very uh, important for the next, for the 21th century. And how we can deliver. And there is certainly no one-size-fits-all model. Uh, but I believe that the uh, European, uh, the European Union's experience on, uh, of putting inclusive multi-level governance into effect can be used at uh, the level of the, of the conference and uh, also in other parts of the world. I hope so. Uh, and, that, and that, that will also be my final question, so you can uh, think about the answer uh, since now. Perhaps a few words on the European Union and more particularly on the Committee of the Regions. It is always interesting to, uh, to, to, to say something uh, about what you are doing yourself, so uh, you, you are sure that you are not uh, speaking about other <laughs> people. Uh, but for our uh, action in the field of climate change, I think it is very important to see what we can really do as Committee of the Regions and also what we cannot do. As you know, uh, we have uh, three uh, decision-making bodies in the European Union. It is a very uh, general, uh, general known uh, element, the Council, 
to the Commission and to Parliament. And decisions are taken in Brussels, in Strasbourg, and also in Luxembourg. It's one of the not so climate like uh, aspects of the European decision model. And these decisions are always based on compromises. And compromises often take uh, very, very much time. And uh, this means that the EU appears at times quite remote from citizens' daily uh, lives. This is one of the reason, reasons why in uh, 1994 the Committee of the Regions was set up by the EU treaty. And the Committee of the Regions is a, cons a consultative body uh, made up of 350 elected representatives of local and regional levels of governance uh, in uh, the European Union. And it is a, really, is a, we want to be and we are, we think that we are the voice of the EU regions and cities in uh, shaping European policy. As a consulta consultative body, the Committee of the Regions uh, drafts uh, political recommendations on EU, EU uh, legislations under discussion and we can uh, put issues on the EU agenda, which are relevant to local and subnational authorities. We then try to convince the other EU institutions of our arguments. And it is not enough to have an argument. Uh, uh, you must also convince people uh, with your arguments. We also try to have a real influence on EU legislation and we also try to make sure that the concerns of citizens of cities and regions are taken into account as early as possible in EU decision making and that, and that is uh, perhaps the most important aspect we must uh, underline on our activities we can intervene in a very very early moment it's a moment when the commission begins to uh, to prepare something then we, uh, the commission must ask our opinion this is a very, very important point. But we have also the possibility to intervene in a later state. If we see that uh, the, com the Commission did not what we want, and it happens regularly, then we can try to make something in the end of the process with the European Parliament. And we can also try to influence the European Council, but that is not always so easy, but it is also possible. And so we, we can really try three times to make an influence on an European decision process. And that is the reason why we uh, uh, can function as a place to create horizontal connections between regions and local authorities all over Europe. But it's not the only activity. It is not our only activity to give opinions. It's important, but it's not the only one. And also a very important aspect is uh, the possibility to create a real uh, two-way interaction between European cities and, uh, citizens and uh, European institutions uh, at the head uh, of the European decision-making process, bringing local ideas into the EU level and also explaining European decisions on the ground. And it's the interaction between these two levels of uh, activities who are uh, very, very important for European, uh, for European su success or uh, failure. In Brussels, we uh, meet once or twice per month. We are in regular contact with the Commission and is a very important partner for us with the European Parliament and also with other institutions. In this multi-level working routine, the Committee of the Regions represents common points of views of the region and local realities, and not just a few of the point of views of a, of a few powerful regions or particular local interests. A powerful region don't need the, the Committee of the Regions uh, if, if uh, she wants to go to a commission. Uh, but if we want to be real, really powerful for all local and regional authorities in Europe, uh, then we must also uh, coordinate a little bit what we are doing. It is certainly important uh, in the field of climate uh, uh, issues, but also in other issues, because if everyone 
goes alone to Brussels, then the, it will be a, a, a little bit chaotic. <laughs> uh, the credibility of, uh, uh, and these contracts we have be, uh, been bu uh, building over the years are very important when it comes to climate policy because cities and regions, as you, you know it, implement more than 70% of all policy measures. Negotiations on uh, action to take at European and, in, and national level are extremely difficult in the current crisis and because of diverging economic starting points. And there we must uh, recognize that Europe is not in the best form uh, since the beginning. Local and regional authorities and the Committee of the Regions are therefore even more important to get the message, the message across and to let people know that we all need to take our responsibilities on climate. Many cities and regions across the, uh, the European Union and globally have already achieved uh, tremendous, ref uh, tremendous uh, results. They are proving that what uh, once thought to be an unrealistic dream is actually uh, doable and creates many spin-off benefits through new jobs, which can be created, a more healthy environment to uh, live in, and uh, innovative, more inclusive and sustainable ways in, uh, of, organization, uh, our, of, of organi organizing our society. In order to achieve this, we need adequate legal frameworks supporting objectives and targeted financial, financial and technical assistance. This is our daily battle, and, and we work towards this through structured interinstitutional institutional dialogue with the support uh, of a dedicated administration in Brussels. And I will very underline dedicated because uh, they do very much work. One of the problems of the Committee of the Regions is that uh, we are 350 politicians. We are the best in the world, this is clear. Uh, but uh, we come, we are coming only two times per month uh, together. F for each one is one time, and uh, it is not enough. After the meeting in Brussels, we have to go back and we have to work at home. And European issues are not the, the main issues we have in our daily work. And that is the reason. That's the reason we are really depending on a very very good work of our administration. The Committee of the Regions place in the EU decision-making process helps create po political uh, ownership at local and regional level. It motivates regions and cities to be more ambitious in their action. It gives them the opportunity to, to talk about their needs and their experience, to learn from each other also and uh, especially from their own and others' mistakes. And it increases the visibility and, uh, of their actions and the recognition of their uh, success. On the other hand, this multi-level governance approach makes the uh, EU more democratic and helps to build trust between the institutions and the citizens. In doing so, it accelerates action on uh, uh, also action on climate. This is exactly what good policy making and effective delivery of results should be about. Building bridge between different levels of government, including all partners in a joint effort to reach a common objective, building understanding between all actors for greater collaboration. The EU model of multi-level governance helps uh, forge a process where all different levels of government understand their distinct responsibilities and how they are interlinked. And this is very important to be interlinked. In this institutionalized dialogue, the different levels support each other in achieving their objectives. The EU and national levels uh, set the framework and provide the supporting structures to help cities and regions maximize their potential for action. While I recognize that this level is not perfect and is continuously changing. I believe that uh, there are some important lessons to be learned about this experience. Uh, to me, the most important lessons from this model is that its success is based 
on the official status of the Committee of the Regions as representing the EU territory in all its diversity. And now if I can ask also a question, because my time is over, I see you are very nervous. I understand <laughs> I have often to I have often to share such meetings. Unfortunately, myself. the room is um, booked for a session yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I must be at, uh, in Eupen at eight o'clock. It's also for me it's also very important to be uh, to finish now. But if I have a, a clear question. It, it's a, a rhetoric one, a little bit, but it's uh, important for the internationalization of the experience in Europe. How do you think that this model of inter uh, multi-level governance we, we, we know in Europe can be ad adapted elsewhere? Uh, and uh, is it possible that it can also function in other parts of the world? And what can be uh, of, on this way, what can be done together on a worldwide uh, level? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lambertz. Thank you for sharing uh, your views, representing realities in the policy making process. And now I'd like to come to Michel Rentenau. And I'm very, very curious about your opinions. Um, how cities and regions and the, the whole sub subnational level can contribute to make EU climate policies successful? What do you think as a climate envoy? What do you think as representative of the presidency? <coughs> well, in order to, uh, to make up time, I probably have to speak much faster. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, is when you get a throat like this, suddenly. Uh, <coughs> you'll forgive me, of course, that I will speak from a government perspective, since I'm actually one of those negotiators in those rooms. Uh, that has to make this happen. Um, we as the Netherlands have been very much a town supporter of the involvement of non-party stakeholders such as cities and subnationals. Um, so I'm extremely happy actually that um, this has been such a great success. I mean, just, let's just look at this shortly. Uh, even two years ago, we could not have imagined where we are today. Uh, we have managed to institutionalize not just the recognition of what it is that you do, and what you bring to, to the fight against climate change. We have managed to actually have a process in there. We've managed to create in the first global legally binding climate agreement that we concluded in Paris, uh, the naming of champions for this action agenda. The fact that we will have a high level event every year in every COP to come. Uh, that's amazing. That's an unbelievable uh, achievement. Um, and I'm actually pretty convinced that we would not have been able to conclude this, uh, uh, this ambitious climate agreement had it not been for partly your involvement uh, in this process. So that's all very good news. Um, but we still have some more work to do. Um, if I can say a few things about the, the general process, which is not only true for cities and subnationals, it's also true for private businesses and other non-party stakeholders. But we've basically all rushed to Paris. Uh, every single meeting that was there was uh, basically in, in order to create more ambition and even more people and more people in the room and more coalitions and more ideas. And that was all good. It was very functional. It was very, very good. But what we didn't really stop to do so much is actually think amongst ourselves, what is it that we actually want from each other? And when I say ourselves, I also mean my own internal governmental circus. Um, what is it that we do? Do we actually, as governments, want to uh, increase uh, or in, you know, basically uh, support so that you will get more ambition as cities and subnationals? Or is it maybe the other way around, that you are actually uh, encouraging us to become more ambitious? Are you the cheerleaders to our government-organized uh, events that we do all the time? Um, are we the monitors of what you do, or are you actually monitoring us? Are we your policemen, or what is the exact relationship? And until now, as I said, it was very much ambitious, focused and everything, and that was great. But I think now it's time to, to have a little bit of a look at what is our actual dialogue about? What is it that we can um, learn from each other and, and be of use to each other? And then you also get into some more substantial discussions on when are we going to have a real meaningful dialogue, for instance, on what it is that you as cities and subnationals, for instance, contribute in terms of tons, actual metric tons in terms of actual reductions. Um, 
uh, the same could be said about the, the whole adaptation agenda, of course. So that is very necessary to do. And um, it has started. I know that you and ICLE and, and C40 and other groups uh, have already uh, had these uh, discussions. Uh, yesterday I was in Vienna on a, a private sector uh, conference where also the same discussion was taking place, where they also said, well, we need to sharpen our, our strategy, let's say, towards each other. Um, and uh, here in, in Bonn, actually, for those who haven't heard about this yet, we have started a group which we haven't really finalized yet the name, but let's call it the Friends of the Non-State Actors or the Friends of the Non-Party Stakeholders to do exactly that. We'll have another one of those meetings again tomorrow. And I can also already say what my question will be at the end uh, is my question will be, what is it that you want from us next? I mean, you have basically stalked us almost for years. Uh, in saying that we want recognition of what we do in that the Paris Agreement. We want to have tangible hooks in there so that we can see how we can go forward. What is now the next thing that you would need from us? And you can certainly count on people like myself, but I'm not alone, uh, that to be actually a friends of the city inside the process and to, to be that advocate inside. But for that to happen, we must, as on the government side, have it clear what is our strategy, but you also need to have that very clear. What is the next thing that you want from us? And that one last thing I want to say about it, and then I think my five minutes are over, is that one of the great things about the Paris Agreement is that we actually institutionalize this once a year uh, high level event, because one cannot underestimate how important it is to have that. Until now, it was very ad hocerish kind of. There were lots and lots of initiatives all over the world. But to have that one moment a year, which is the market where everything comes together, is hugely important. I go to many of these meetings where we interact, let's say, or whether it's private sector or cities, it doesn't matter. I mean, many of those. And there is a fatigue coming. There is basically, you cannot possibly sustain this amount of meetings. The, the big mayors will not come to 20 meetings a year. The big CEOs will not come to 20 meetings a year. So we need to rationalize a little bit and we need to figure out what are these key moments in the year that will feed into that high level event at the COP every year. And my vision is that I have two kids, 14 and 16. My vision is that that high level event is like the launching of the new iPhone every year. It is basically a line across the building around everything Everyone wants to see what are the new ideas, what are the new coalitions formed, what is the new things that we have come about to basically tackle climate change. And what better place, Morocco, to, chart, to start a souk like that, a bazaar if you like, to have the first one of that, where that market will take place. And I'm sure that you also as cities and subnationals can come up with something strong. You can do it here in the bond sessions, in technical examination process, in lots of other feeding meetings, let's say, and come up together with a collective agenda to present every year to come. Thank you, Michelle. And to build an bridge. Thank you, Michelle, and you have built an excellent bridge to our next speaker, namely to OECD, Economic Cooperation and Development. Let's bring business in, let's bring uh, industrialized nations beyond Europe in. I'd like to have an expanded view from your side um, and also an idea if countries outside the EU would have had would have similar strategies perhaps and what would be applicable to them you have heard about the committee of the regions you've heard about what ICLE does worldwide um, what happens in the OECD and uh, what could be your approach to cities and regions Tadashi you should move to Marika's place for the presentation Thank you. Um, so first of all, um, thank you for inviting us to the, this important event. Um, I was happy that I can come last minute, even I wasn't registered in the <laughs> beginning, but uh, thank you, thanks for the ICLE, uh for this opportunity. I wanted to start um, with a uh, yes, global perspective, uh, the one that uh, was uh, the, the event that 
took place in, in Japan, uh, as I'm Japanese, um, last week, uh, well, 10 days ago, there was a G7 environmental ministry minister meeting, and I'd like to congratulate the ICLE that uh, there was a, maybe uh, many of you know that uh, there was a session, special session on the role of cities in environment. That's, uh, that's, I think it's a remarkable thing, and it doesn't, you know, it's not, Something it's different from what uh, we have been achieving in, in you know in Paris, as uh, as Mr. Rentena mentioned, you know. And then in a G7, it's a ministerial meeting, it's a national me me meeting with a, with a, you know G7. But still, there was a special session on on cities, and then uh, Ikure was invited, and uh, also you know there was a. Uh, reporting session that was a, a meeting of the mayors, but also there was a meeting a reporting session to the minister on the next day, and then they reported what are the real, you know, role of the cities in environment. I think that's already like a, we are going towards that direction. Um, in terms of my work on the OECD, uh, we are, uh, are working with city uh, uh, in, in my team. Uh, on, on different issues, economic development, climate is one of them. But uh, I'd like to just uh, stress that um, the, the role of the OECD is actually we are supporting the member states. So we are directly working with the city, but also we are working supporting the cities as an organization. So we are in a good kind of uh, you know, well positioned that we are listening to what, uh, you know, the cities want and and also we have a direct communication channel to the cities through the OECD network so uh, I'm uh, of course uh, in charge of this city and climate change issues and uh, very happy to to contribute but with this uh, uh, maybe I already spent like three or four minutes and then last uh, a few minutes I'd like to uh, stress the role of uh, lot of national urban policies yeah um the, very much traditionally speaking the city urban policies or like city planning urban urban planning uh are something that city government will do and national government has a has a little bit of hands to cities action right so that's a well very much traditional view but actually in many national uh, policy fields, starting with GDP, economic growth, climate change, uh, sustainable development. Now it's really, you know, the central government cannot think of any of the national performance without the contribution of cities. Yes, climate is, of course, the one, of the, one of the important examples. So what I'd like to stress is that now it's really the time, uh, it's a good opportunity, good moment that uh, national government are now starting to think, okay, we really have to take care, I mean, to, to, to take into account of the contribution of cities. Again, not only the climate issues, so that's that's why it's important. And then I'd like to uh, just stress uh, that this year we have a Habitat 3 meeting, I think many of you are involved, and the OECD is also very much promoting the role of uh, uh, national urban policies. So as, a, as one of the key um, in implementation tools of uh, new urban agenda, which will be adapted in Quito, in Ecuador, we are promoting that national urban policy should be the one that we have to, you know, think about. And then if, you know, this thing becomes uh, one of the key implementation tools of the, key, of the new urban agenda, then actually, you know, coming next 20 years, every country will think about, okay, let's, Let's make a new, you know, national urban policy in their their country. You know? And then, of course, climate change is one of the things. And then we are we have a good position again. Okay, every country starts to think about what is a national urban policy, what is the role of cities in in climate change discussion. So, in the coming few years, there is a good you know window for us to 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 think together with uh, with the central government. Okay, so that's my key message, which is a little bit different from what I'm <laughs> showing in this slide, but uh, you know, that's basically my uh, message here today. So I need a question, right? Yeah, so uh, what, uh, so again, uh, I'm seeing that many countries are now uh, preparing 
will will prepare national level urban policies. So my question would be, what do you like to see in that national framework? Thank you very much. Thank you, Tadashi. That was quick and very efficient. Uh, I think we'll come back to that in the question round later. And now I want to bring in Brendan and the um, Galvanizing the Groundswell of Climate Actions initiative. Uh, you really want to give a boost to climate action worldwide. And um, when you hear about the European and non-European initiatives, are there key elements making them particularly successful? And what can be the role of government levels in order to achieve a maximum benefit for the UNFCCC process? Brendan, the floor is yours. Terrific. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you to ICLEI and the Committee of Regions for organizing this very important and, and timely event. Uh, so in my role as discussant, I'm going to uh, respond to what some of the panelists have said, but first of all, I'm going to actually respond to the framing of this side event. So it talks about the preambular paragraph 15 of the Paris Agreement, uh, which was very important in terms of recognizing uh, the role of all governments at all levels and stakeholders um, across various parts of society. And this was, you know, un probably un unheard of or wouldn't have happened even a year or two before Paris. Uh, so that was very important. But in my sense, and I think as we've heard from some of the other panelists, it was much more so not with what was in the Paris Agreement, but what was in the COP decision and even in the sort of more informal realms that really, really helped to drive action and set up uh, the system for, for multi-level governance that will hopefully yeah. bode very well going forward. Uh, so as we heard, uh, one critical element of that um, as we heard from Marika and Michelle, was the Lima to Paris Action Agenda, um, which provided a platform for cooperative initiatives from cities, states, uh, regions, private sector, in, uh, institutional investors, uh, civil society to really come with very concrete uh, action-oriented deliverables and initiatives, which is you know very different from the usual kind of uh, very abstract negotiating of the UNFCCC. C. So I think that was a very welcome, uh, fresh breath and kind of uh, grounded perspective that it brought. Um, and as Michelle said, I think it really was an innovation actually in global governance, you know, to have this agenda be brought in as the fourth pillar of COP21. Uh, you know, it stood alongside all the other key elements, such as the national contributions, the financing, and the legal framework itself. And uh, Paris was going to succeed or fail based on whether those were all there. And it really helped to bring all the other different pillars along with it. Um, so under this action agenda, there were 72 different initiatives uh, spanning sectors from renewable energy to energy efficiency to forests, um, and including initiatives like the Compact of Mayors and the Covenant of Mayors. Um, we did a study actually of all the initiatives and the action agenda and we found that there were 10,000 different participants and that they were aiming to be implemented in every single country except for one. And this can be a trivia question for later, but I'll give you a hint that it's in Europe but not a member of the EU. We can come back to that. Um, so this action agenda really captures a lot of these more transformational initiatives. And then the other piece of the puzzle was Nazca, which was alluded to, which was launched in Lima and sort of provides this broader uh, scope of the entire or the growing universe of, of climate action happening at all levels. Um, a, a study by Yale University found uh, that just the cities on Nazca um, are represent over, there's 7,000 cities and they're in over 100 countries. And that's just the cities. And there's many other stakeholders that are featuring their, their actions on Nazca. Um, so that was, was really important. And then as uh, others have mentioned, there were a couple um, other important pieces to the decision as well too. So this uh, high level event, uh, as Michelle mentioned, is really important to provide the kind of touchstone and the marquee event for everyone to focus on driving their deliverables for, to come and showcase their progress. Uh, to learn from other initiatives, how they're doing, to build, to bring new partnerships in and to find uh, resources to continue to sustain them. Because as we all know, you know, Paris was a big uh, splashy moment, but we don't want them to trail off afterwards. I want to keep that momentum going. So hopefully the, the high level event will provide that function. And then we also heard the, the champions as well too, the high level champions, um, which will be appointed by every COP presidency. And we now have the two first inaugural champions appointed uh, in Laurence Tubiana from the French team and in Minister uh, Hakima El Haite from Morocco. Uh, so very much looking forward to, to their vision and their roadmap for how they can continue to help all these initiatives uh, reach their full potential and, and make sure that uh, this coordination, both vertically and horizontally, uh, is maximized. 
Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention, because I know we're running short on time here, um, is the sort of connection between um, the bottom-up action and sort of NDCs and, and country contributions. Um, so there's growing consensus in uh, kind of a number of different parts of the community that 2018 is going to be the next big moment for international climate action. And some people are, are already trying to organize a subnational summit, which could be, you know, kind of the next forcing moment for all the initiatives to say, okay, we have two years to really, really ramp it up. How many more cities are we going to bring on board? How many emission, how many tons of emissions are we going to reduce? And then that obviously is very strategically timed to tie into the facilitative dialogue at the COP later that year on the collective adequacy, adequacy of progress uh, and also very much inform um, the formulation of, of countries' uh, developments of their NDCs before 2020. So hopefully that energy, the dynamism, the leadership that we're seeing uh, from subnational and local governments can be channeled into that and much better taken uh, uh, account of in the next round of NDCs, because we know it didn't really happen uh, very well last time. Um, and just the final um, sort of informational point on that, there was a study released uh, this week actually in Bonn by the New Climate Institute that found um, that um, if countries did a better job of taking into account some of these initiatives, such as Covenant of Mayors, Compact of Mayors, uh, Compact of States and Regions, they could actually uh, overachieve their current INDCs by about 25%. So the EU uh, could reduce about one to, to two gigatons uh, by, by 2030 additional on top of what its INDC is. And a country like the US, uh, where I'm from, could get uh, similar levels of magnitude. Um, so these, you know, Michelle talked about, you know, adding these things up and, and getting the kind of full aggregate uh, impact of them. And I think we're starting to get some metrics that show that these are, these initiatives really are powerhouses, maybe not necessarily on their own, but once you start adding them up, they really have significant potential. Uh, so I think I'll wrap it up there um, and just say that the action agenda, you know, really was a, a, a real innovation. It needs uh, some work and a bit of framework kind of going forward. Uh, hopefully we'll see that uh, coming online here as the champions are starting to shape their work uh, and more stakeholders are, are having input to the process. But we're very excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, have you brought a question for us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so my question is uh, sort of on, on this vein that I was just alluding to is how, how can we ensure that countries, and maybe there's some parties in the room, but even beyond countries, just ourselves uh, as stakeholders in this climate action agenda can ensure that um, countries are encouraging their own cities, states, provinces to join up with these initiatives like the Compact of Mayors, like ICLE's uh, Carbon Registry, like the Covenant uh, of Mayors and others. How can we make sure that you know, we're communicating about these opportunities and that there is a real sense of this is what's going to help drive action in countries and make the space for more ambition going forward. So a uh, question mostly on communication. Thank you for this question. Uh, and before we're going we're gonna to answer it, I want to come to a city now. Jan Francoise from Paris, uh, he's keen to share with us his thoughts about what a city would like to have and would like to do in the context of post Paris and raising ambition, accelerating action. Jan, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's, it's hard to be the, the last speakers. They, they, they said so many bright things before me and I'm so totally agree with you, especially for Michel and specifically on the topics of so many meetings that everybody wants to have the bigger meetings, the bigger meeting with more people. And if we reduce those meetings, we reduce CO2 emission by flights. Uh, but it's not a topic here because it's forbidden to talk about emission from planes and for shipping. Sorry. Uh, so um, I think maybe it was a miracle for, for catching so this agreement in Paris when we compare two years ago and so on. And it was my record maybe to have a uh, so impressive demonstration from cities uh, during this period. And I think maybe for me, one of the main challenge for the next years is to maintain this pressure, this positive pressure from all the different cities, different networks, but also this high level confidence we created between the different levels of government and actors high level confidence between the local to the subnational, to the subnational to the state, the state to the parties, when it's the same, 
and at the end, the local levels to the NFCC's program. It is not so easy. And uh, for that, maybe we have two main topics for me. The first is to stay or to be uh, a global steady cities team. And I will explain why. The second is to increase our credibility face to all the different actors. And the second is to diverse our different financial supports uh, to act, because the main uh, important thing is to act and to implement different actions. On the first topics, uh, why we must be a global steady cities team? One of the miracles, but it was on the pictures that you, you, you shown on the first slide uh, on the summit, uh, once again, one summit, in Paris City Hall on the 4th December, where there is so many uh, local leaders gathered to send one mes message, finally, to the parties. Uh, what's the miracle is that there is no more so many ego on these pictures. We have had all the different cities, networks gathering in some one day and one decision and so on. And I hope that we can still work together more and more. But I'm scared that after this momentum, after the big pressure, maybe currently we have a big little depression, after that it's normal. Everybody goes back to the office and want to share his own objectives and to be maybe the best networks, best cities and so on. But we have no more time for that. We have time to share experiences, to improve our capacity building if we want to be credible. And it's why, as I, I hope I'm wrong, maybe you can say a clear from your vision from networks, but compared to other networks, uh, maybe sooner have, we'll have a vision from the C40, but should, is it, apparently it's a secret. Uh, but uh, we have to improve our credibility. Credibility face to the states, face to the subnational level, local governments and so on, because uh, we, we currently, in, it's a different session here, uh, parties are talking about transparency, how to monitor and so on. It's the same case for city. We have to improve our transparency of the data, of the budget, how to implement the actions, the cost of the actions, the non-cost of the actions, the core benefits and so on. But we, are, we don't have the same level of uh, competency in different cities, so we have to share. Thanks to the cities network, thanks for OECDs and so on, uh, to share that with cities more advances to cities less advances and so on. Different regions, different topics. We can improve our credibility thanks to that. Credibility face to the climate change process, but credibility also face to private investors because we need to diverse uh, financial supports to implement more and more in our different cities. And if we improve our credibility, if we improve our capacity building, sorry, to implement, to monitor, to check, we will improve our capacity to go to, to church, other financial support, because private supports are available, but they need guarantee. And you talk about public investment, and so on, but maybe in cities we are not the better one to send guarantee. We need sometimes guarantee for the states. So we, we have to improve that. And it's my three main topics, to improve our credibility, to stay a global team, sharing our experiences, and to implement more and more. And to implement more and more, and not only face, for example, mitigation, face to adaptation, and so on, because we don't have more time for that. But my question uh, for conclusion uh, is, uh, what does it mean, finally, a city on the pathway of 1.5 degrees? We talk about that, 1.5 degrees. But what does it mean for a city? What does it mean for citizens? How many CO2 ton CO2 will be authorized to spend in 2050? Uh, what does it mean for a city we which have other goals, sustainable goals, but also air quality issues, solidarity issues, houses, housing accommodation, and so on. So it's a wonderful question to solve. And what is the definition for us? Maybe we can design together a city on the pathway on 1.5 degrees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan. And now we are at the point um, to come to you, to the audience, before we go to these um, final questions, which 
might easily be grouped. Uh, there were Michelle, Brendan and Tadashi basically asking what do local governments and regions want parties to provide to them to advance. Um, Mr. Lambert's asking if the EU model a model can be applied in a, in a bigger framework beyond the EU. How can we all collaborate and what has to happen to a city to come to 1.5 path? But now I'd like to give you in the audience the opportunity to make comments. Um, I would like you to introduce your name and, and organization first and not exceed 30 seconds. So a short round of comments, I think three to five comments, please, if you want to comment or ask a question, raise your hands and uh, Cesar will come to you with the mic. Well, we're also testing this fantastic <laughs> thing which is called a catch box, so we can just throw it if you want, but just let us know. Okay, any party who wants to comment or uh, NGO present? Or would you... Ah, there's a question. Cesar, you want please. to try the cash box? <laughs> ah. 30 seconds, please. And name an organization first. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Riyad Mukadam. I'm um, a party. I'm representing the Marshall Islands, a small country in the Pacific. And its population is mainly urbanized. So I bring that context into this question. There's a lot of uh, conversation about national and local governments and how they should cooperate and integrate both ways. I'd like to hear something about, from the panel about how the private sector uh, can be engaged through the national government. And um, I say that because I find that the private sector is often engaged at the local level uh, as taxpayers and so on and so forth often uh, and is able to mobilize quickly at the local level. So what are your thoughts across the board on post Paris? What is the engagement of the private sector with uh, local governments? Thank you. Thank you for this interesting question, which gotcha. might be directed in your direction, Michelle, afterwards. Another question or comment? We're all afraid to catch you. <laughs> we also so, have the other mic, just in case. Are there Twitter questions up to now? <laughs> so Twitter is silent. Um, so what we could do now is uh, Michelle answer that question first to the Marshall Islands delegate. Go ahead. Um, now, obviously, there are parallels between these. Um, again, I'm speaking from the government and negotiators' perspective. And for us, the, the overarching uh, mantra, let's say, is that governments cannot possibly solve climate change alone. And then, obviously, there are different constituencies that you need. And one is, yes, indeed, the cities and, and the provinces and other subnational authorities. But a very obvious one is also the private sector, of course. I mean, we started before uh, Lima even in quite shady small rooms where there was no press and there was no publicity at all. And we, we started having conversations with the bad boys, let's say, you know, with Shell Oil Company and with others. Let's say, what, what is it that you need in this text that we're negotiating? And one of the very obvious things was that there need to be, be a price on carbon. Uh, not just the technicalities of it, whether it's an emission trading system or a tax or whatever, but also a, a general price, uh, yes, let's say, you know, like the, in American Western movies where they say there's a price on his head, uh, so CO2, dead or alive, kind of. Um, so that concept needs to be worked out. And um, we started doing that and we had a number of, of more organized meetings. And the first one was just a meeting was the message. The fact that we were in one room was already a big thing. And then we started going a little bit further. And um, very obviously, when you read the, the Paris Agreement and, and the COP decision, there is still a lot that needs to be negotiated out. Um, and, and that's what we're doing, basically. We have identified at least 50 work programs out of the Paris outcome, let's say. And we're doing that uh, with, with, with private sector. But they need to be 
um, also doing this, what I advocated earlier for, to have a common strategy. And I must give you a compliment, cities and subnationals are way beyond the pack. I mean, at least you have a common strategy. That's not nearly the case for most private sector. They're, obviously, there are competitors amongst themselves, and there are very big differences between the DSMs and the Unilevers that win all these prices for sustainability, Paul Paul, and you know them, all the names, let's say. And then, you know, the oil and gas sector is again a very different sector, but that below that is some really serious polluting businesses like Tata Steel or whatever. It doesn't matter the name, but with all these levels, you have to interact. Um, and uh, that's definitely happening, but. Uh, if they would also come together and, for instance, through the World Business Council on Sustainable Development or We Mean Business and other uh, umbrella kind of organizations, this can happen. Um, and they also have links into places where we don't come. I mean, through the OECD, for instance, I'm sure you could say something about that. The G20, the G7, those kind of places, the World Economic Forum, where the real powerhouses sit, let's say. Um, that would be a very good approach to take. Uh, would you like to step in quickly, Tadashi? You were nodding all the time. <laughs> well, uh, on the private sector issue. On, on the private sector issue, of course, sure. Um, so again, uh, the role of the OECD, we have a chance to offer a, a forum or, you know, like a high level political forum or like a more very much technical, you know, expert meetings to discuss these things. And then, you know, there are different ways. If it's only the place like a COP or this bond meeting is, is a place, then it's, you know, it's very much formal place. But in the OECD, we have a different channel. And of course, you know, as you said, the Business Council for Sustainable Development, they have another different channel. So I think it's very important to, you know, Again, uh, I'm not uh, meaning to create another big conference in, in everywhere, but it's very important to have uh, different channels where you can, you know, uh, put in private sector perspective into different perspectives and so on. One example that I have is uh, what we call mayors and ministers roundtable on urban issues. This is one of the rare place that, you know, ministers and and mayors in different countries can can talk you know this is well ministers can talk with each other mayors can talk with each other but there's not very you know many places where you can find you know ministers from different countries or mayors from different cities and then talk together you know so this is one example private sector can do the same Quite an historic actually episode. Name me one example where capitalist business asked to be taxed. I don't. I can't think of any example. They are themselves asking for a carbon pricing because they know they smell the coffee. They see the world is going in the wrong direction, and they see their investments are at risk. So this is an excellent time uh, to actually have this discussion. Now let's get the momentum uh, and I see Marika signaling and I want you to do, do, to, to do two things Marika actually uh, give a short answer to this question and perhaps start wording what do you the local and regional governments want from the parties the question which was asked three times literally. I'll be efficient and combine both answers into one. Um, agreed with Michelle, we need the business sector, <clears throat> the industry sector on board. For that, we need also enabling framework conditions that national governments are in the position to create and only national governments. Uh, for example, uh, what we need are solid green public procurement rules, which need to trickle down from the national government to local and subnational governments that embed environmental criteria, low emission uh, products and services. So that's something the national government can, can do. There's excellent examples already in place on that and much more can be done. But that would stimulate certainly an interest from the business sector side also in providing green, clean products and services from the mitigation side, potentially also for the adaptation and resilience side. Um, I think um, we, we counsel or we participate um, or partner with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. That's for us also as ECLA, a logical partner, another association that brings together um, uh, companies uh, that have a similar vision or a shared vision um, to some extent. These, these are maybe bodies that could also help stimulate and promote um, more active participation of the business sector um, in this field and partnering 
city business partnerships is for us critical. There we can see huge potential for scaling up. But again, there needs to be a win-win for everybody. Um, and that's exactly what they need to map at the local level. At the national level, what do local and subnational governments need? We need support in the sense of solid, sound policies that do not block action, that do not um, even stand neutral towards action, but they need to actively support and stimulate action. And there are also good examples on that uh, around the world, global north and south. And certainly I think the parties can learn from each other on that particular topic in the framework of the UNFCCC. But I think also we need more dialogues where that exactly that mapping should happen in every single country where a dialogue between the different levels of government needs to take place in a confidential space where everybody can speak in comfort and be quite clear and frank about what they need uh, without fear of attack. Um, there are always tensions between levels of government. This is also natural, but we need to now move beyond that to explore together what is needed and, and really do a mapping exercise. Where are the gaps? What is blocking action? And how action can be scaled up together, um, which means also exploring coordination mechanisms, discussion mechanisms, um, ways how local and subnational governments can report to national governments and vice versa. So there are many things where we can focus on processes, on governance and on policies. Thank you. That was very quick. Anybody to add on this question or could we pass uh, to the EU question now? Okay, I think that is the case. Um, Mr. Lamberts, you all asked about um, the role model of the co Committee of the Regions and how this could be applied um, on a bigger context. Um, may I di direct this question to the bigger context, namely to our scientists here? <laughs> Brendan, would you like to make a comment on that? Could a model of this um, representative governance and policy making instrument be applied outside of the EU? I'm glad I've been uh, uh, I've been promoted to a scientist from an NGO, so that's uh, an increase here I, I wasn't expecting. Um, in terms of translating the, the lessons from the Committee of Regions, I think it's a, a really great model. I, I didn't really know too much about it until today, so I, I'm, I'm really eager to, to learn more about it. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the context that I know best, which is probably the United States and Canada, and thinking of how that could work. And obviously, we have a, a federalist structure over there too, but it's much more, you know, focused on kind of state level, I would say, than than urban issues have sort of been neglected for a long time, or, or sort of having a bit of a, of a resurgence. I don't think that there could be anything that's, you know, necessarily officially mandated through the Congress, because we have a few problems uh, with our Congress these days. Um, but I think there are a lot of informal avenues that we are uh, beginning to see sprout up to kind of create um, more uh, and facilitate more interaction across all levels of government. So, for example, uh, the White House has an Office uh, of Intergovernmental Affairs. They were very, very active in the lead up to Paris and COP21 in terms of encouraging their cities to join the Compact of Mayors. Uh, they also, partially to answer the gentleman from the Republic of the Marshall Islands question, they also did a challenge for their businesses, the White House uh, Act on Climate uh, Business Challenge, where they basically got their largest businesses to kind of sign up and make commitments um, and, and created that domestic political constituency that could help counter some of the other businesses who are saying, oh, we shouldn't be doing that or this is going to you know, affect our competitiveness. So I think there are kind of more informal models that, that are happening. Um, but in terms of establishing th something as robust as a committee of regions, I think uh, we're probably a little ways off, but hopefully can aspire to, to learn some lessons from them. Thank you, Brendan. Um, the question I would like to direct to all of you now is the question Marika brought up. How can we all collaborate to raise the level of ambition, to accelerate action and to really make Paris walk the talk. Um, I would ask you to have like a 30 second statement, each of you now, before we try to close the session. Starting with Jan, please. Uh, as I said, we, we don't have no more time to waste time. So maybe the main thing in 30 seconds that don't be ashamed about our different failures, our different fails, because when you go to different conferences, you have cities that are showing that their best examples, their best 
issues and so on, but they never talk about uh, the unsuccess and how, because we, we can, of course for a politician it's not good, but we can learn from that, we can win money for other people, and it's not because it fails in one place, maybe it can succeed in our, another place, maybe it was not a good solution. So in 30 seconds maybe we can learn from each other from our different fails and to share that quickly with our no more comparisons. Thank you. Brendan, please. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think exactly what we need is a sort of framework architecture to really harvest lessons from cities in various different geographies, but that may share many similar uh, challenges or characteristics. I think, you know, we, we see a lot of good sharing among next networks like C40 and others, but, you know, to really push the, the ball forward and drive uh, the needle, we, we need to make sure that we're actually getting to some of the medium-sized cities and the smaller cities, and they're just, you know, not engaged in this conversation. So I think to set up some sort of framework, not to have more meetings necessarily, but uh, an architecture that can help share those lessons and really get to that kind of missing middle of, of cities and bring them all on board, especially in developing countries, uh, will be really critical. Right. Um, I'd like to make a bit of a contradictory statement to yours, Brendan. Actually, ICLA brings in the smaller cities as well as the mega cities, um, and we have a, a fair distribution global north and south. So it's happening, but it's slow to slow, and we need to scale up, certainly. Um, echoing what, what both of you said so far, fully supportive of that. Uh, what we do need is having much more dialogue with each other, not reinventing the wheel, I think, is, is part of mapping uh, and, and getting that framework in place. A lot a lot of foundation elements are in place already, and we should use those and scale up. Um, and what I do see is every time they, if people think they have a new thought, they do not check if it's been done already, um, which means we do waste time and we have no time to waste. So really, uh, between local government uh, associations and networks, that's part of ICLA's uh, work as well, where we reach out um, and would like to collaborate more uh, with different networks that we pull forces, because if we do that, we can pull uh, different products and materials and guidance in different languages. We need to give resources in the different local languages, and that's a major challenge. This, uh, but there are fantastic tools and things out there for any local government of any size and shape that we can bring to them um, as a practical support effort. So that's very much where we're going to. This uh, governmental climate train is unstoppable. Uh, it started and it's going to continue, but it's your job to keep us on the rails and to make sure that we stay in touch with the real world, which is about real problems, whether it's in the Marshall Islands, in Argentina, in the European Union, wherever, with all our differences, and to make sure that that real world with real problems, but also real solutions, keeps being fed into this governmental process. Because trust us, we have been negotiating this stuff for 20 years and managed to fumble it for a long, long time. Now, this is a game changer, this involvement of others, you. So you have a responsibility, you have a task. And I'm asking you two things. One is keep pounding that COP president to make sure that that once in a year souk, bazaar, market, whatever you want to call it, is that moment. Because you can have a thousand meetings, it's not going to be as successful or impactful if you get all these governments together. So whenever you come across, the, in this case, the Moroccan keeps saying, I have ideas, this is what I'm doing at home. And tell them and ask them, create my market, make sure that you have this place where you can all, uh, you know, basically lay out your ideas and everything. That's the one thing because that is the only way how we can keep this machine rolling and making sure that every president has a huge incentive to make his cop the most successful one ever. And just like any country that organizes the Olympic Games, they will also want to say this is the best games ever. That's the first suggestion. The second one is in answer to Brendan's questions, actually. What is it that you can do at home? And here I think I can also give you a suggestion. One thing that we're organizing in the Netherlands, and perhaps this can be copied elsewhere as well, is organizing something called Bring Paris Home. As was said, there are about 11,000 ideas, initiatives, coalitions, etc., already in the NASCAR portal. And you could actually just take them off the net and basically organize, possibly together with your governmental person in your country, wherever you're from, and say, let's organize a national climate congress meeting, whatever you want to call it, and use that as a mirror to your society. 
And just like in the Netherlands, we're going to do that and we say, well, these are the 11,000 and perhaps 20% of them uh, have some sort of Dutch actor in them. But that gives an 80% scale of possibility. It's enormous. You don't have to all come up with the invention of the wheel. I think you we, should, we, should go, we should go there, definitely. And, and do this everywhere. And, and it can be done in developing countries as well. And then basically the results of that is what feeds back into that same high level event every year. And you create a loop that keeps lubricating the world until we've solved this problem. That's highly desirable. And now I want to switch the order, have Tadashi first come in and leave our co-organizer, Mr. Lamberts, the last word on the panel. I'm taking advantage of sitting in this place because I'm just in front of this um, slide. Um, well, actually, I wanted to um, emphasize the importance of the evidence-based discussion. Um, knowledge sharing is another important one, but knowledge sharing part we discussed a lot today, I think. But uh, what was missing a little bit was, you know, the importance of creating knowledge and then share. And then creating a knowledge part, of course, you know, it takes time. And then we, when we are going to talk about multi-level governance issue, it's another difficult part, challenging part, how to measure this, you know, efficiency of multi-level governance. It's very, you know, hard to to you know, have a tangible assessment of, of this. But uh, what I like to, to you know, one of the takeaway from the OECD today is like uh, you know we are making a, a, a toolkits how to assess a country's multi-level governance structure. We have a, a toolkits, we have an indicator, and uh, we have a sort of ways to 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 measure it. And this is a very general for public uh, government, public investment so far, but this year towards uh, the Marrakesh, we are trying to develop a specific uh, assessment tool of multiple governance on climate change um, investment. So that's what you know we like to do, and then we like to continue to support this uh, you know, agenda. And you're keeping up us updated, I hope on this toolkit. Mr. Lamberts, your comment. Yes, everything ha has been said, but not by everyone. So <laughs> I will try to say the same in other words. And in 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm OK. Uh, we have a clear roadmap. COP21 was a very great success at this point. But now we must go to the implementation. The train started. But he, he must have more speed and he must maintain this speed during a long time. And we can do it by a better sharing of best practices, cooperation, and make a combination between uh, the legal rules we need and who are really important, especially in the context of the private sector and concrete action on the local and regional level. And, and there we can do very much things inside Europe, but also all, uh, outside and on the level of the committee of the region. My last remark, we will try to make climate change also a priority in our work with Arlem, with the Mediterranean countries, and also in the context of the Eastern Partnership. And that's the reason we will have an event with Arlem connected to uh, the meeting of Marrakesh. Thank you very much for this excellent closing remark. And I want you to do one thing here in the room now. I want you to create a new hashtag. And it is called the 1.5 city. 1.5 city. This is our hashtag. And I want you to answer to Jan and his question, what does it mean to a city to join the pathway to 1.5? So if we are lucky, we have a vivid discussion on that, which will really help cities to implement. So let's stay in touch. Let's go ahead. Let's accelerate and raise ambition. And thank you for attending this side event and staying in the dialogue. Bye.